We're heading into an inheritance boom, but families can't seem to divide the money and property without dividing the families. The only thing I did want were the personal things. I was devastated. How to protect the inheritance and the family relations. That's coming up on Money Track. Money Track is made possible by the Investor Protection Trust. The Investor Protection Trust is a nonprofit organization devoted to investor education. Over half of all Americans are now invested in the securities markets, making investor education and protection vitally important. Since 1993, the Investor Protection Trust has worked with states across the country to provide the independent, objective investor education needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. This is Money Track. Your guide to investing and protecting your money. This is Money Track. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Money Track. I'm Jack Gallagher. And I'm Pam Kruger. With our friend Chloe. And today we are on a hot, hot topic. Nice setup, Pam. <laughs> Well, it's true, and here's why. Americans are about to roll into the biggest inheritance boom in history, and that giant pie is going to be worth somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion dollars. I knew that number would get your attention. And it did, and all of that wealth will be handed down from one generation to the next over about the next 40 years, and that means that literally millions of baby boomers and their kids are getting ready to inherit a slice of that pie. Or not. You obviously didn't grow up in my family. Well, the issue is that all of this wealth comes with major baggage. Family money can cause family feuds, and you don't have to be rich and famous to get caught up. So the question is, how do you divide up the family assets without dividing the family? Right. There's so much at stake here because when brothers, sisters, second cousins, or even close friends wind up in court to haggle over money or real estate by the time it's over, guess who's gotten the biggest share? Uh, the 25-year-old stepmom and her kids? I'm going to let you guess again. The lawyers win. Yeah. And today on Money Track, we're going to show you how to avoid the battle of the wills. And to protect what took a lifetime for a parent or a grandparent to build. Our own emotions can ruin relations. Mm -hmm. Who's the favorite? Who's going to get Grandma's condominium in Florida? Forget the condo in Florida. Who's going to get Uncle Barry's stock portfolio? <laughs> Boom. See, it got very quiet in here all of a sudden, Pam. Well, that's because talking out loud about what's going to happen after somebody is gone is just downright awkward. Uncle Barry might decide that he wants his portfolio to go to his dog. Mm -hmm. You know, that happens. Well, it does. And he probably told the dog. But he didn't tell anyone else. People do that, you know. That is true. Well, Money Track reporter N. Day Walton just got a good sense of how two families with inheritance issues took two different approaches with completely different results. Right, N. Day? That's right, Pam and Jack. Who would have thought that having money can actually create problems? And we're not just talking about the super rich here. According to the Federal Reserve, one out of five of us is expecting some sort of inheritance. On average, we're talking maybe $25,000, and that's just enough money to unravel even the closest of family ties. My Aunt Audrey was a very special person. Audrey was blind, played the piano from the time she was four years old. We were just inseparable. People still talk about it. They convinced Audrey to uh, give them a power of attorney over her Merrill Lynch account. There's a paper trail of, of a number of cash transfers for about $3,500 just on the day she died alone. I was included in nothing. The only thing I did want were the personal things, and they were not in the will, and I was not given them. It was the worst thing. I was devastated. To loot an estate and take advantage, especially of someone who's handicapped and who's dying. I really am outraged. We as a family are still all close. On the Reinfeldt side, the friend side, you can forget. I wouldn't bother with any of them. We did settle. They ended up with more of the share than they would have. I would have been busting that door down a lot sooner, asking a lot more questions and trying to be a lot more involved. 
I don't know who I would have yelled and screamed to, but yes, I would have. But if it's somebody you care about, try to stay involved. Mom, dad, aunt, uncle, do you have everything in order? Have a good estate lawyer, get them to the right professional. Start early enough. You must tell that to everybody, it is urgent. Well, the Reinfelds have their regrets, along with millions of other families dealing with this very same issue. The worst part, when family members can't agree, everyone loses. The legal fees alone can eat up about a third of the value of an estate. But there's good news. There's a way to protect your money and keep those family relationships intact. There are a ton of baby boomers who are doing just that. And we found out about one such family in the pages of Kiplinger Personal Finance Magazine. We were so impressed with their approach to this that we had to come here to Yarmouth, Maine to meet them for ourselves. Hey, how are you? Good. Thanks good for morning. having us. Good morning. Good job. Eldon Morrison tells me his family enjoys the good life these days. So you got some spare time on spiking that stuff. He credits most of that success to the construction business he started some 20 years ago. But it was just five years ago while standing in the middle of a busy construction site and approaching his 60th birthday, Eldon says he realized that not one of his children was in line to take over the business he had worked so hard to build. It's a case where you build up wealth over a period of time, and then you say, what do I do with it? Mm -hmm. And you have to make some decisions. So Eldon turned to his friend and financial advisor, Phil Harriman, to help him put an estate plan together. It's time to sit down and talk about what you've built and where you want it to go from here. Phil suggested they start with a family retreat just to figure out what roles his daughters, Stacy, Denise, and Susan, would play in the business, and to broach the delicate topic of who would eventually get what and why. Today, all three families, uh, his daughter and two of his son-in-laws, are actively engaged in the business. They have specific leadership roles in the company. When we had a moment alone, Eldon confessed to me that it wasn't just the business he was worried about. He hopes to keep the peace among his daughters by not repeating a critical mistake his own father made. He chose to divide his estate up into thirds, just one third, one third, one third. And I didn't think that was fair. My sister and I got into an argument about the homestead, and that, that is still going on. We aren't talking to each other anymore. We aren't uh, communicating at all, except through lawyers, which is no good either. And these three daughters discovered that dividing things equally probably wasn't going to work for their generation either. It's always been one third, one third, one third for three of us. So then you start working that, you're thinking, well, how can you really make something in a state or the company work in thirds? Mm -hmm. You can't, so you kind of have to trade off. And they say trying to get to this understanding wasn't easy. People left the room and were upset, and nobody was really speaking to each other. We had to get Phil involved again uh, for some mediation. Eldon tells me they meet twice a year, and that everyone here agrees the only way to keep things fair is to keep the lines of communication open. Are there challenges ahead? Sure. Uh, is the business always going to do you know, great every Probably not. But at the end of the day, there is a clear purpose of where we're going, how we're going to get there, and if the unforeseen happens, we have a plan. So Pam and Jack, as you can see, two different families with two totally different outcomes. You know, that's really eye-opening in day because I always thought that kind of discussion happens after somebody dies, but the point here is they'll need to constantly update the plan while the parents are alive and alert. Right. Mr. Morrison was actually shocked to discover that once they had that plan in that notebook, it didn't mean that it was over and done with. It's a living, breathing document that always has to be revised. And Dave, do you think the fact that it was Mr. Morrison, the parents' decision to hold these meetings, that made this so successful for them? Definitely. Uh, Mr. Morrison wanted to ensure that all of his hard work and his hard-earned money didn't go down the drain. So he was very motivated to put a plan in place that would protect his legacy. See? I told you. Hmm. Okay. Thanks, Sunday. We'll see you next time. Thanks. I actually have a conversation I need to go have with my own family now. <laughs> see you later. Now, see, I told you, when parents bring up the subject of who's getting what, everybody listens. So you're saying that the money topic is completely off limits unless the parents bring it up? I don't know about that. Well, you want to hear what Ben Stein says? We'll let him settle it. 
I know that you sat down with him and asked him this question one-on-one, -on -one, Pam. So this is a little bit of an awkward conversation to have. Mom and Dad, how do you plan to divide up the house between us kids or those <clears throat> brokerage and IRA accounts? I mean, who's supposed to initiate this conversation? Is it the adult kid or the elderly parent? I'd say if the adult kid initiates the uh, conversation, he should get slapped. I mean, it's an incredibly sensitive subject. It's one that should be bought, brought up entirely by the donor. Uh, for the donee to bring it up is very rude and aggressive. To say, how much am I going to get, or say anything remotely like that would be horrifying. OK, so I can understand that in a perfect world, the parents raise the topic if and when they want to. Mm -hmm. OK, I'm with you on that. Okay. It makes total sense, because the inheritance is supposed to be a gift. It's like frosting on the cake, but not the cake. OK, so what about all of those adult kids who are waiting and counting on that inheritance to pay those bills later on. You know, we have a viewer in the tiny town of Osterville, Massachusetts, who's actually in that situation with a question. Heather? Hi, Pam and Jack. Here's my situation. I'm 40 years old. I'm not married. I don't have any money set up for retirement. I work a couple of days in a cafe. Fortunately, though, I'm very lucky. I do expect to inherit some money from my parents which I definitely plan to use for my retirement. But you guys are always on the show talking about how much you need. What am I or anyone in my position supposed to do to plan? Hmm. OK, so let's pose her situation to Les Kotzer, a wills and estates lawyer, as well as the author of the book, The Family Fight, Planning to Avoid It. Les, how can you help Heather? I like the fact uh, that Ben said that uh, parents should be communicating with their kids on this issue. I agree, but that generation generally didn't do it that way. Uh, they don't like talking about these issues. And from Heather's point of view, she may say to her parent, you know, mom and dad, uh, do you have a will? Do you have power of attorney? I think it falls on Heather to bring this conversation up. Now, Heather, do you have any brothers or sisters that would get part of this inheritance? Yeah, I have one sibling. I have a sister. If there is a sibling, get that sibling involved as well in the in discussion so that there's no surprises when parents die. Well, Heather's family has obviously not yet discussed specifics like the Morrisons from Maine, but she is counting on receiving enough money to retire. Now, what happens if instead of $400,000, her share is only $40,000? Then that wait-and-see approach might backfire. The fact is, is that a person should never rely upon a third party uh, for money in terms of inheritance. Uh, many times parents pass away and don't leave what a child expected. They see mom's expensive home and uh, drive by it and say, boy, you know, one day that's going to be mine. Well, it may not be theirs. Mom may have sold it in advance. Mom may have had to go into a nursing home. That, that's why the baby boomers, you know, they may not get what they're thinking they're going to be getting. So clearly Heather's family's intentions are good, but they need to be out in the open. Again, it all comes back to discussing, you know, planning ahead, being self-dependent, uh, and, uh, and sitting down with your siblings, with your parents, with your grandparents, and talking these issues out now while the parent or the grandparent is still alive and can still do things, can still make decisions, can still change their will. Once a parent or grandparent has lost their mental capacity, they cannot change their will anymore. So now's the time to talk. Les Kotzer, author of the book, The Family Fight, Planning to Avoid It. Thanks, Les. Yeah, thank you, Les. I think we've all gotten some great advice out of this. And look, Chloe's taking great notes. No you. way, she's not getting hurt here. <laughs> you know, Pam, this dog is smart enough. She's not going to be left out of anything. You're not saying that Chloe is spoiled or anything, are you? She's probably already been to the lawyer. <laughs> well, since this show is have so you? much about family, we have wound up in the family rooms. Everybody That's comfortable? Perfect sense to me, sure. Let's and go. it's time for our quiz question. This week's question is, what is probate? And we're going to do things a little differently this week, and we're not going to give you quite as much time to answer the question. So, actually, time's up, Pam. That was pretty quick. Yes, it was. Well, here's the answer. Probate is the court's supervised disposition of property in accordance with the directions in a will. And now this process can take months and procedures can vary from state to state. And notice that I said it's the will that gets probated. A trust is usually treated differently. We're going to get into that in a second. That's why it is so important to spell out exactly what you want when writing a will. Now, we have another question from Rick, who's in Austin, Texas. Rick, what's on your mind? You mentioned estate planning. When I hear that term, I think of families like you showed earlier in the show. They seem to be pretty wealthy. What about average families? 
We've got kids and own a house right here in Austin, Texas. Do we need a state plan? Now the fact is, Rick, that if you or your parents even own a home, you're probably a candidate for some degree of estate planning, and that doesn't mean that you have to set up an expensive trust. Estate planning just means that you've thought through your intentions and that you have a document that can speak for you. We've asked Mary Beth Franklin from Kiplinger Personal Finance to be our guest professor for Investing 101 today. Mary, do you have to be wealthy to consider some estate planning? Pam and Jack, the whole point of estate planning is to protect what you've worked a lifetime to accumulate and pass it on to your heirs. And if you don't take the steps to put it in writing, then who knows what's going to happen. Well, Mary, a will is a set of instructions that tells the court exactly how you want to pass on your property to heirs, and it takes effect at the time of death. But is just having a will enough for most families these days? What a simple will doesn't do is appoint someone to make decisions for you when you can't. It might be medical decisions about what sort of treatment you want, or it might be financial or legal decisions. Maybe you're going in a nursing home and, and you can no lo longer sign your checks. You need someone to do that for you. And then you need a legal document that says who that person is. Mary, I think a lot of people operate under the assumption that an estate plan means setting up an elaborate trust, like the Morrisons, not only to protect everyone, but to somehow reduce taxes on an estate. For most people, estate taxes are simply not an issue. At the moment, you have to have more than $2 million in assets before the federal government comes after your estate for taxes. Now, in the case like the Morrisons, who had a business and a lot of money, they probably do have to worry about estate taxes. And they need to take steps to plan the most efficient way to pass on their property and pay the least amount of taxes. But frankly, for the average American, they never have to worry about estate taxes. We pointed out a will is a set of instructions that takes effect once somebody has passed away. A living trust is a little different because these are written instructions that can apply during people's lives or afterward. And they cost a bit more than a simple will. Lawyers charge anywhere from $2,000 on up to create a living trust. But Mary, aren't trusts so popular because they avoid the whole probate process? Sometimes you'll hear advertisements about living trust. This is the way to avoid probate, save money, save time. Well, in some cases it's true, and in some cases it's just a flashy salesman trying to make a lot of money and sell you a document that might not be appropriate. So first of all, figure out what you have, what you want to pass on. Go to a true lawyer and say, do I need this? The more complicated your situation, the more advice you need. Let's say you've got a second marriage, maybe you have a business like the Morrisons. Uh, things can get complicated and you want to make sure that everything that you owned, including your values, are passed on to your family. Well, that's good to know, Mary. Thanks very much. And by the way, Pam, you should know that when you die, not you specifically, but when folks die, the estate is responsible for paying off their debts. And I won't really care. No, <laughs> My family's going to care. Yeah. Ew, why'd you bring that up anyway? We Sorry. were talking about protecting the wealth. But everybody does need a will and a medical care proxy at the very least, whether it's a simple document or you walk into your lawyer's office. Now, in the next 60 seconds, I'm going to show you where to find templates for both trusts and wills online. So we're using this simple will template from nolo.com. You can find it on our website now. We all need this because if you die without something legal in place, it's the state who will step in and tell your family who gets what. Now filling it in takes less than about 10 minutes, assuming you've put some thought into it first. Now once it is filled out, you sign it. You don't even need a lawyer to make it valid. If you have kids, you really need a will because it names who would take care of your children should anything happen to you. Okay, finished. It's printed, signed, witnessed. Now what? You don't have to file a will anywhere. You don't have to give it to a court. All you have to do is keep it in a safe place, perhaps a fireproof box in your home or a home safe, but make sure your executor knows where to get to it when the time comes. And NOLO also has a living trust kit, but it does cost about $25 to access. And keep in mind, even with a trust, you should still have a will as backup. Now, we spent most of this show telling you why it is so important to talk openly about finances with close family. And it's especially true when loved ones are getting up there in age. 
And that's because we tend to become more vulnerable, more trusting as we get older. Sometimes senior parents need their kids to watch out for them in order to steer clear of phony investment pitches, even when the pitch comes from a close and very dear friend. Head up. Head up. Yay! 65-year-old Ruth Mitchell was retired after decades as a professional skater and coach. That's what it's all So why is she back on the ice? The more I skate, the more I can forget about what Barry Corkin did to us. So perhaps if I do 10-hour days, I'll forget about him altogether. I don't know. Do you slide the bagel in here? Ruth's husband, Len, was also retired after 55 years as an architect. But now he, too, has gone back to work in his garage wood shop. We are going to uh, put those on eBay. The Mitchell's dream of a leisurely, fun-filled retirement was dashed when Len Mitchell's CPA and close personal friend Barry Corkin stole the couple's entire $100,000 nest egg. It was just like putting a dagger in my heart. I figured, oh, that can't be. He was their accountant and did their tax returns. Uh, and gave them advice. They trusted. He'd known some of these people for years. And then all of a sudden, he decides that here's a way for him to make a lot of money. As investigators Larry Victim and Jim Clutenati now tell the story, Corkin lured nearly 40 friends and clients into a phony real estate bond scheme, the ironically named Guardian Investments. Corkin promised his victims a whopping 7 to 8 percent return, and for 11 years he kept the scam alive by sending them so-called dividend checks, really just their own money, along with phony statements. Attorneys, architects, nurses, people from all walks of life accepted these statements on face value, never questioned Mr. Corkin's background. They also never questioned Corkin's lavish lifestyle, although the CPA made no effort to hide it. Once we find that we can victimize people and it's easy, and we can go undetected, it opens the floodgates up for certain types of individuals to just go hog wild with other people's money. But the IRS noticed, and as agents converged on him, Corkin confessed to a scam that by now had netted $11 million. I was mad, and I was very, very, very depressed to a point where I had to get medical help. But Ruth Mitchell fought her way back. She started giving talks, cautioning others about affinity fraud. The U.S. Senate heard about her and flew her to Washington. I want to be able to talk to people, not as an expert, certainly, but as a been there, done that individual. And she started skating again. Each month is a little tight for us. And I was thinking, well, if I could just work a few classes or just make a few extra bucks a month. All right. This is a happy place, and it's something I love to do. It's kind of impossible to be unhappy if you're here. <laughs> That's just sad. That's sad. It's really sad. And believe it or not, it gets worse because not only did the Mitchells lose their nest egg, but they paid taxes on the so-called income from Barry Corkin for 11 years before the scam was exposed. So what happened to Corkin since? Well, Barry Corkin was sentenced to just over seven years in federal prison for fraud and tax evasion, and his victims are expected to receive roughly 30 cents on the dollar after all of Corkin's assets are liquidated. I think that's about typical. We've seen this kind of scam go down in churches, families, and even now among longtime close friends. We have learned an awful lot today. Bullets, please. One. To preserve the family assets, please, parents, understand the kids may not work it out later. Talk to them about it right now. And kids, adult kids, your inheritance should not be your retirement plan. Heather. Heather. <laughs> we now know that estate planning is not just a hobby for the rich. Mm -hmm. Everybody needs some kind of written plan ahead of time. Remember, if you ever became incapacitated, it would be too late to update your wishes. And finally, don't let your guard down when it comes to investing. There are all kinds of scams. You just saw one couple who lost their life savings to a trusted close friend. To find out more about affinity fraud, head to our website. It's moneytrack.org. Click where it says scam alerts to find out if the deal is real. That's right. And now I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should set up a living trust. I have a living trust set up. It's all done. In fact, my kids set it up for me, and it was kind of a surprise. They've got the pen now ready. Now all I have to do is sign it. Actually, you know what you can Maybe do? Maybe I should read it. 
<laughs> what you can do yeah. is set up a trust, for example, that if you wanted mm -hmm. your kids to learn your values and inherit your values before oh. they inherit your money, say your work ethic, Jeff, mm -hmm. then you could actually set up a trust where your children are not going to get a dime of your money until they earn a certain amount of their own money by going out and working. How's that? I like that You idea. like that? I might put my kids in touch with you. Would you help them <laughs> rewrite the living trust that they've got They'll for never me? never speak to me again. <laughs> anyway. Well, we're going to figure that one yeah, out yeah. later. All right. That is our show for today. And if you missed anything at all, we're online all the time. Here comes the website. Plus, don't forget, Chloe took really good notes today. Excellent notes. I'm going to review her notes. For the <laughs> exactly. See you, everybody. Bye, all. Well, since this show has been so... Yeah. She's looking for the bacon. No, seriously, Pam, come She's back. She's looking come for on. the bacon. Come on, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> That's our producer in the other room yelling at us. I see you. I see you. We're heading into an inheritance pool. I've seen the light, too. I saw the light. Wise guy. Pam is punching me. Stop it! Stop it! Cut it out! I hate that! How to protect the inheritance and the family relations. That's next on Money Track. Dun, dun, dun.